So I think, you know, you can have been just uh, worthwhile to say that I'm a poet, that's it. You know, that, that, that says a lot. And I'm here to uh, share with you the power of poetry. I don't know how many of you write poetry, uh, but poetry is something I'm very passionate about. Uh, I have done several things in my life, but uh, poetry is something I owe my allegiance to. Uh, can you hear me properly? Or? Yes. So, so I have been dreaming poetry, and I see in my dreams poems written in the eyes of galloping Pegasi. Pegasi are uh, special horses, you know, they are creatures, mythological creatures in Greek mythology. Poems written in the eyes of galloping Pegasi on shells of crawling snails. Printed on colorful wings of swarming butterflies on the serratic teeth of giant killer sarks on the claws of eagles hovering in the sky. I see poems on the bodies of naked angels, poems flowing in the veins of buffaloes. I see poems on the petals of roses, poems rising like, poems rising as scanty thorns. I see poems swimming like blue wells, rising like a phoenix from the ashes of bird books. I see poems smiling, whispering to me in weird voices. So that's the power of poetry. But most of us, or most of you who write poems, or who read poems, or who are called poems, they wonder what is exactly poetry? What it means to be a poet? And uh, I have thought it long what poetry exactly means. And uh, I have also, like uh, other poets, tried to find out what exactly is the meaning of poetry. But poetry is such a giant creature, it's like an elephant. And we who read poems and who write poems are like blind men, finding, trying to figure out is, a, is the elephant a trunk or or is it, is it a pillar, or is it a huge mass of body? So poetry is like an elephant. And each poet tries to see it from his or her own perspective. So the German poet Goethe, uh, you might have read his, some of his poems, he said that those, just to give you a little bit of introduction and the importance of poetry, what they thought, he said that those who had no ears, eyes and ears for poetry and music are barbarians. And this was something which was echoed by uh, Kabir Bradriheri, who was in 5th century AD, or common era, who, was, uh, who said that Sahitya Sangeet Kala Vihina Sakshatya Pashu which means that those who have uh, no, uh, those who are without literature and music and art are like animals. So uh, there is there is similarity in views uh, between a South Asian poet or South Asian writer Rathlihani and the German poet who was centuries later. Uh, who came century or who wrote centuries later after Pratyari and uh, Goethe. Uh, but uh, what's the, uh, uh, do you agree with this? Uh, would you agree that uh, those who have no taste for poetry are barbarians or animals? Would you? No? Exactly. Uh, I think I share, share, view, share. Uh, the similar views that uh, it's, it's too harsh to judge uh, those who don't share taste for poetry to be animals or to be barbarians. So let's see what what ha what people have to say, what poets, famous poets have to say about poetry. 
uh, so William Wordsworth, whose poems you might have read, he said that poetry, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, which was also echoed by Sumitra Nandan Pant, one of the poets from the South Asia, who said that Biyogi hoga kahla kari, aha se upja hoga gaan, umar kar aankho se chupja, bahi hogi kabita anjaan. But it is poetry, but would you agree with that? Is poetry spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions? Yes? Yes. So that, that but that's like seeing like the blind men, uh, as the blind men see elephants. It's the same thing, because uh, of course, uh, that's also true for poetry. It's a spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions, powerful feelings. But then there is also art and craft of poetry. There is also uh, use of figures of speech or poetic devices, which make poetry poetry. And, uh, 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 and, uh, and a very famous poet who defended poetry in 1800 and uh, in 1821, who wrote a very famous essay called In Defense of Poetry. Uh, 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 Shelley, um, he said that poetry is expression of imagination. So, uh, uh, so you see different poets, you know, they see poetry very differently and you are free to see your poetry, see, see poetry uh, as you like. The best friend of William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he defined poetry as the best words in best order. And Charles Dickens, who uh, was not known, or who is not known as a poet, he said that uh, poetry makes life what light and music do to the stage. And British poet Matthew Arnold, he had a very philosophical take on poetry. He said that poetry at the bottom of all is criticism of life. And he thought that poets are natural creatures complaining about life all the time. So each poet has his own, own idea about poetry and uh, I think that makes poetry beautiful. That it's not, it can't be contained in definitions. It gives, it, it, uh, it gives you the freedom to expand uh, horizons of your imagination. Everything is possible in poetry. That's not possible in any other art form. And the, echoing the sentiments expressed by Goethe and Ratrihari, uh, the Russian Nobel laureate Joseph Brodsky, uh, he says, what distinguishes us from other members of the animal kingdom is speech, then literature, and poetry in particular, being the highest form of locution. And he went on to say that the goal of our poetry is the goal of our species. But that might be a bit too much. Uh, that poetry is the goal of existence of human beings. And, what, and he goes on, he, Brodsky describes poetry as a unique art form, like no other. In his novel, uh, Crying Acceptance Speech, and he elaborates the idea of uniqueness of poetry. And he says, there are, as you know, three forms of cognition. Cognition is the way we gather knowledge, the way we um, acquire knowledge. And these three modes of the cognition are, the first one is analysis, the second one, intuition, and the third one, any idea, third one, how do we acquire knowledge? The third one is revelation, and, and uh, which was known to the biblical prophets. And what distinguishes poetry from other forms of literature 
is that it uses all these three modes of formation at once, simultaneously, gravitating primarily towards intuition and revelation. For all of all the three of them are given in the language, and there are times when by means of a single word, a single rhyme, the writer of a poem, the poet, manages to find himself where no one has ever been before him. Further, perhaps, than he himself or she herself imagined. And these, these phrases, these words, they surprise the poet himself. And there, poetry, poet and poetry readers are surprised that poetry's power to reveal rare and unexpected relationship among words, thoughts, ideas. And I, I would share this poem, short poem with you, which, uh, which brings together words which have never been together. And in a way, uh, this is where the future of the language invades its present and poets and the poems become the means of the survival of the language, the means of its renewal, the way language reincarnates itself, keeps itself fresh. So the, uh, the books you read today of poetry, uh, the language you read today, uh, that's not the same language which was a century earlier or a, or a thousand years ago. So language is like a living creature. It, it, it keeps on refreshing itself. It keeps on renewing itself. And the poet and the poems are the means through which the language renews itself. So here is a poem for you. Quark of a poet. Quark is the smallest particle that exists in this universe and that makes all the elements. Uh, it makes first uh, the neutrons and protons and electrons and uh, when they combine, they make atoms and atom makes uh, atoms when they combine, they make molecules and molecules when they combine, they make elements and elements, uh, you know that we are made of five elements uh, in, in mythological sense, but uh, but when elements combine, they make matter. And we are uh, manifestations of matter. So, uh, the, whatever we see in this universe is made of quarks. So, this, here is a poem uh, which... Uh, and the universe, you know, the word the universe is a very unique word. Because the meaning of the word universe is universe. You have to break it into two. It's one verse, which is one poem. You see, so so now see the rare combination here. Pay attention to the words. Quark of a poet, blossoming in the subatomic space, writing the universe. Quark of a poet, blossoming in the subatomic space, writing the universe. A, a robot dreamt that it was fast asleep and dreaming. Story of the man written in acidic double helix as DNA. Story of the man written in acidic double helix where the soul hides. So here, in these three, uh, in these three uh, short um, poems, it, you see the words which have never been together. A robot dreaming, or a quark as a poet writing the universe, or, uh, or acidic double helix and the soul. They have never been together. And, uh, and that's 
what poetry, that's the power of poetry. And that's the power of, because power of poetry is the power of imagination. And, and here the poems, they bring together words in a new relationship and thus renews language. Pablo Neruda, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, he believes that poetry reveals the secret manifestations of nature. He writes in his memoirs, I believe that poetry is an action, ephemeral or solemn, in which there enter as equal partners solitude and solidarity, emotion and action, the nearness to oneself, the nearness to mankind and to the secret manifestations of nature. And here is another poem uh, which I, I want to share with you. Uh, it's called Neem. Neem is a tree. Uh, and Neem is, uh, you know, is the most widely found tree in Delhi. Uh, if you happen to be in Delhi, you would find Neem trees all across the city. And uh, not only, it used to be, Delhi, you know, Delhi has history of uh, being an eternal city which never dies and so far it has had seven cities and one city rises after another from the ruins of another city. So here is a poem Under my, under my ubiquitous shade lie scattered cities of Delhi. I and Delhi are one and the same. My yellow greenish fruits, delicious when dry, bitter when raw. Only the wise know the difference. So this poem, I'll repeat it once again. Uh, under my ubiquitous shade lie scattered cities of Delhi. Ali and Delhi are one and the same. My yellow green fruits, delicious when ripe, bitter when raw. Only the wise know the difference. Here is a, here is a poem which, uh, uh, which tries to reveal the nature of Delhi. Mm, what the city is like. And uh, because Delhi has, you know, Delhi has had a great history. It has had a series of uh, emperors, invaders uh, coming to, coming to, you know, uh, enticed by its uh, its wealth and its its uh, its rich history. Uh, which is there's another poem which uh, about Delhi I would like to share. It's uh, my smell. My nakedness, my smell, my nakedness entices hordes of human flesh from far away lands. Traders, emperors, marauders. I pose nude up on the hill below the fist of eagles. But this intoxicated. And in that light, Neem, uh, the poem, uh, it, it tries to reveal the secrets of Delhi. It's, it, it. So poetry, the great Caribbean poet, Derek Walcott, echoed the sentiments of Brodsky and Neruda when he spoke in his novel lecture, Poetry is Perfection Sweat. <laughs> but which must seem as fresh as the raindrops on his statues grow. It combines the natural and marmorial. It contradicts both tenses simultaneously, the past and present. If the past is the sculptor and the present the bits of dew on rain or rain on the forehead of the past, there is the buried language and there is the individual vocabulary. And the process of poetry is the process of excavation and self-discovery. 
to mark these words, the process of poetry is process of excavation and of self-discovery. And I made my discovery, self-discovery, uh, with these lines when one evening I was walking the stretch that connects Kirunimal College of Delhi University with Delhi School of Economics and St. Stephen's College and the Delhi University's Rose Garden. And the revelation or self-discovery was this. I was always here as the blowing wind or the falling leaves, as the shining sun or the flowing streams, as the chirping birds or blooming buds, as the, as the blue sky, as the empty space. I was never born. <coughs> I didn't die. What poetry does here, that it, it rhythmically restructures time. It transcends one from quotidian or, or daily routine to transcendental. It's, it, it transcends death into immortality. And that's the power of poetry. Seamus Heaney, whom we lost this, uh, this month, called this process of self-discovery and excavation as digging. And in his eponymous poem called Digging, he writes, Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pain rests. I'll dig with it. And a man, and as a man dedicated to poetic, poetic form, Seamus Heaney, he observed that poetic form is both the ship and the anchor. What the necessary poetry always does, which is to touch the base of our sympathetic nature, while taking in at the same time the unsympathetic nature of the world to which that nature is constantly exposed. So we always, within us, find this fight between the good and the evil, the sympathetic nature of mankind, or being a human, and being an animal. And what poetry does, that it, it always exposes our unsympathetic nature to our humane and sympathetic nature. And the form of the poem, in other words, is, a crucial, is crucial to poetry's power to do the thing which always is and always will be to poetry's credit. The power to persuade that vulnerable part of our consciousness of its rightness, in spite of the evidence of wrongness all around us. Poetry reminds us of our being human. It reminds us of our human nature. In spite of all the wrong that's happening around you, it has the power to remind us that we are hunters hunters and gatherers of values. That our very solitudes and distresses are creditable in so far as they too are an earnest of our veritable human being. Poetry provides us with a daily dose of ecstasy. It takes us to a higher plane of existence. And the poet, Emerson, he says, to, to emphasize this, to underline this, 
take all away from me, but leave me poetry. I believe poetry will raise. But then comes the question that why write poetry? So a person, first of all, when a person sets out to write a poem, he or she does it for a variety of reasons. To win the heart of the beloved, to express his attitude towards the reality surrounding him or her, be it a landscape or a state, to capture his state of mind at a given instant, to leave as he thinks at that moment a dress on the earth. So all of us here, when we start writing poems, it always begins with a love poem. And then poetry evolves and poets evolve. The subject matter of poetry gets diversified with time. And from love poems, we, we travel a long journey, a distant journey. When we start writing poems and become the voice of the voiceless. So the, the inanimate objects like chairs, like the microphone, like, like the sofa, like the computer, like the dogs, animate animals, they start speaking in your poems. And that I consider as the highest stage of writing poetry. When the love poems with, with which the poet begins gets transformed into poems which are voices of the voices. Bronski said it better. He said, one who writes a poem, writes it not because he holds fame with posterity, although often he hopes that a poem will outlive him, at least briefly. One who writes a poem writes it because the language prompts or simply dictates the next line. Beginning a poem, the poet as a rule does not know the way it's going to come out and at times he is very surprised by the way it turns out, since often it turns out better than he expected. Often his thought carries further than he reckoned, and that is the moment when the future of the language invades its present. I started writing poetry to express my inner awe and angst, the wonder, and disgust I felt in Moscow. The river of poetry started flowing out of me. There was nothing stopping it. It was worse work in a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. I had no idea how my poems were going to shape themselves. I wrote primarily to preserve the exquisite beauty of the moment against the incontestable ravages of time. Because we know that time destroys everything and to preserve the moments, the beauty of the moments is extremely important for a poet. And that's, that's how I started writing poetry. And only afterwards, death immortality, nature, heroism, beauty, time, universe, cities, bureaucrats became subject matters of my poetry. So, this thing for you, if you look carefully around you, you will observe this, that persons whom you love, are going to leave you. 
for heavens or for better opportunities. The career you love is going to end someday in retirement. And you too are going to leave this world one day. Only your words, your poetry will never leave you. Till you are alive, and chances are that your poetry may outlive you, even briefly. And this is the one strong reason, I think, one should write poetry. Derek Walcott, he puts it very elegantly, he says, I have kept my own promise to leave you the one thing I own. One thing I own. My poetry. There is nothing else we own in this world. Nothing else except our words, our poetry. So how should poetry be? If you decide to write poetry, uh, I have given you a, one very strong reason uh, to write poetry is that something that's going to stay with you forever. So how should poetry be? The Russian poet Maria Svetaeva, she believes poetry should be delirious and lucid. The very nature of voice in written poetry must be metaphorical. You understand the difference between literal and metaphorical? Yes? Literal is direct, metaphorical is indirect. indirect. The very nature of voice in written poetry must be metaphorical. It cannot be literal. So, this is a key distinguisher of poetry and prose. That poetry is always metaphorical. Or at least good poetry is always metaphorical. I, I get very disheartened uh, when I see in Kathmandu Coast and Republica uh, poems uh, printed every Saturday or Sunday uh, which are terrible poems, which are bad poems. They could be good prose, but not a good poem. So, uh, when you write a poem, always take this measure of judgment that poetry can never be literal. Poetry has to be metaphorical. Poetry is expression of imagination. It's not expression of reality. So, uh, Edward, Edward Hurst, in his book, How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry, writes, In great poetry, there is always a dialogue between the individual and history. There is a powerful dialectic operating in our lives between reality and imagination. It goes on every moment. Between history and philosophy, between the temporal and eternal. Two contradictory elements meet in poetry, as two tenses, past and present, meet in poetry. In the same way, two contradictory elements, the two uh, dialectics, the opposites, they come together in poetry. Ecstasy and irony. That's what Edward first phase. But then there is no, for me, there is no ideal form or content of poetry. Only approximations. Each poet and society values its own kind of poetry. Truck drivers all across South Asia cherish their own poetry. As Philip Larkin or Sharon Old do or the lovers of Sher Shari do. Kabir Bidhi's Pithi couplets 
world with man beneath long prose poems, each poet for his own. And that's, that's the freedom poetry provides. But then uh, one has to be careful, uh, which the one, one way to judge it, which I have given you, is that poetry has to be metaphorical. Whatever you write, it should be, it should be, it should turn the ordinary into extraordinary. The, the key, the mic, they should, they should become objects of imagination. The chair, the red chair, would not be merely a red chair. It would become an extraordinary red chair, full of glory and, and glamour and and, and full of possibilities. And that's the power of poetry. Now, many people wonder, you know, many, many, many poets, you know, they have been writing poetry since ages, but they have doubts. Many of us write poems, but we have doubts, calling ourselves poets. And this is one question which, uh, which you know, poets often ask, am I a poet? What it means to be a poet? I think many of you would have written poems, but uh, uh, leave, leave those who write a few poems. Take those who, who are established poets. Even they have self-doubt. They wonder if they are poets, So many of us write poetry, few of, our, us, few of us are published poets whose works have appeared in various poetry anthologies. But how many of uh, you would call yourself as poets? Any, any, any hands up? Only one. So, so Vislava Simborska. The, Pope, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1996 from Poland in her Nobel lecture, which was interestingly titled The Poet and the World, said, Contemporary poets are skeptical and suspicious, even or perhaps especially about themselves. They publicly confess to being poets only reluctantly, as if they were a little ashamed of it. And that's from someone who has gone to win Nobel Prize in Literature. Maria Svetayeva, a Russian poet, she says that we, we are poets. This expression has the sound of outcast, that we are Somehow we are different from the society. We are we are we are away from the society. And Pablo Neruda, he says, the poet confronted nature's phenomena, and in early ages called himself a priest to safeguard his vocation. So uh, uh, even in early days. Poets, they never express themselves candidly, never, uh, never call themselves poets. In fact, they disguise or themselves as priests and in other occasions to safeguard their livelihood. And he goes on saying that today's social poet is still a member of the earliest order of priests. In the old days, he made his pact with the darkness, and now he must interpret the light. And that's a huge task for all of you who are poets, confessed ones, or, or secret ones. Any idea what the word poet means? You know, it comes from a Greek word called poesis, which means to make. And poet is essentially a maker. 
And what does he make? Like the bread makers, they make bread and shoemakers make shoes. What does a poet make? What? Poems. So a poet's function is not to experience the poetic state. Poet's function is not to experience the poetic state. His function is to create it in others. That's what he makes. A poet or she makes. A poet has to create a poetic state. The experience of a of awe and transcendence in others. Not to experience it himself or herself. A poet is recognized by the simple fact that he causes his readers to become inspired. So if you are inspiring somebody through your words, through your poems, your job is well done. And there's a poem here which is called Chitwan. You know, you all know Chitwan? So see here, Chitwan, how, how, how real Chitwan is and how Chitwan is here in poetry. You know, what, uh, everywhere. Chitwan has, you know, the elephant rides and, uh, and then you have the rowing in the old uh, Rakti river. Uh, and you have the rhinos. Uh, watching, you all been to Chitwan? Yes. All of you? Yes. Okay, so here is a poem for Chitwan. <laughs> a river, a river full of crocs, crocodiles. A river full of crocs. A canoe, canoe is a small boat. A canoe filled with dreams. A river full of crocs, a canoe filled with dreams, rowing. Can you see the images here? A river full of crocs, a canoe filled with dreams, rowing. Eerie silence in the jungle. Eerie silence in the jungle, an elephant. Riding a human. Trees strolling. Eerie silence in the jungle. An elephant riding a human. Trees strolling. Statue of a frail man. At the central square. Statue of a frail man at the central square in the city of Rhinos. Statue of a frail man in the central square of the city of Rhinos. So this is Chitwan. So let me take you to Brodsky, who, uh, who writes, who said in his global lecture that the one who writes a poem, writes it. Because verse writing is an extraordinary accelerator of conscience, of thinking, of comprehending the universe. Mark these words. One, one, the one who writes a poem writes it above all because verse writing or poetry writing is an extraordinary accelerator of conscience, of thinking and comprehending the universe. Having experienced this acceleration once, one is no longer capable of abandoning the chance to repeat the experience. One falls into dependency on this process the way others 
fall into dependency on drugs or on alcohol. <laughs> One who finds himself or herself in this sort of dependency on language, I guess what they call a poet. And I think this is the best definition of a poet I have ever read. That a poet has to be condemned to poetry as a wolf to his honey or a dog to his barking. The dependency of a person on language as the dependency of an alcoholic or a drug addict on drug and on alcohol. That's what we call a poet. So, next time you ask this question, what it means to be a poet, if you can't live without the daily dose of ecstasy, you know, daily dose of ecstasy you get from, the, from a poem, then the day does not pass without reading a poem. When you feel that you are addicted to poetry, because you need the ecstasy, you need the elevation from routine to, to transcendental plane, to, to a higher plane of existence. That means you are a poet. And this is something very simple. And Brodsky, he brings the poet to the center stage of the language and literature. He says, the poet, I wish to repeat, is language's means of existence. A poet is language's means for existence. Or, as my beloved audience say, W.H. Auden, another poet, poet is the one by whom the language lives. I who write these lines, or the poetry, I who write these lines will cease to be. So will you who read them. But the language in which they are written and which you read them will remain, not merely because language is more lasting than man, but because it is more capable of mutation. You see, it, the language you write in, whether it is English or in Nepali or in Hindi or any other language, the language is going to outlive you. We are going to go away after 50 or 60 years, but the language will remain behind us. It will remain, uh, remain there for the generations to come. And, uh, and personally, I have felt that Poetry is communication, communication across generations. Sometimes your poets are read by someone who is going to come 200 years later or 100 years later. Sometimes your poems would not be understood as the wise principal said that uh, the poem he read was not understood during the time of the poet who wrote it. But now it's recited this fine morning after 100 years. So that's the power of poetry. It's going to outlive you. And it will be read by different generations. So it's more of a communication to, to the generations to come. And how see, uh, uh, Brodsky says that no, poets, poetry is by which the language lives. And here is here are here are few uh, new words which I had to I had to uh, to 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 you know um, to invent new words to express exactly express what I want to say. And here is a word called bureaucrat. Uh, you might not have heard about it, but. Uh, 
But did, uh, you must have heard the word bureaucrat, right? Bureaucrat? All of you know bureaucrat? Uh, what does it mean, a bureaucrat? Who is a bureaucrat? Yes? Who is a bureaucrat? Government official. But you might not have heard the word bureaucrat. No, so bureaucrat, you know, it's, it's, it's something uh, which, uh, which, you know, describes exactly what I want to say. And it's, it's I'll just read the short uh, introduction to bureaucrat. There are several thousand species of crabs in the world. A rare species notable for walking sideways with strong claws and armored shell. The most notable among crab species is the bureaucrat. Highly skilled in keeping others firmly in the proverbial bucket. So, uh, so bureaucrat is something which uh, you know which you would uh, like to describe when you deal with bureaucracy. And this is the way language invents itself. It gets new words and it keeps itself alive. There is another word called spiritual. Spiritual, you know, this is uh, uh, this is something which uh, which describe which describes spiritual and sensual at the same time. And these new words, which are born out of imagination, they reflect how much language is capable of mutation, and why do we need new words to to keep the language alive? There's Ernest Hemingway. You know, Ernest Hemingway. He said that retirement, the word retirement, is the ugliest word in English language. But we have not been able to find a suitable replacement. And I think it would be up to you to come out with, with your imagination with something new, a word which could redefine retirement, which could put imagination through the whole process of retirement. And I think when we meet next time, you should have, a, you should have an answer ready. What, what word? Retirement is the ugliest word in English dictionary, according to Ernest Hemingway, but nobody has found a replacement of it so far. And it's a poet's job to find a replacement. And those of you who are poets, uh, I, uh, I exhort you to find a replacement, to come up with something more imaginative, more lively than the word retirement. But see, now I'll end it with something which Neruda had his thoughts on poetry, you know, with all the great things about poetry. Now uh, I would uh, bring you to the ground. And Neruda says that I have often maintained that the best poet is he who prepares our daily bread. The nearest baker or, or the maid in the house or, or your mother who does not imagine himself to be a god. He does his majestic and unpretentious work of kneading the dough, consigning it to the oven, baking it in golden colors, and handing us our daily bread as a duty of fellowship. And if the poet succeeds in achieving this simple consciousness of a bread maker, of a baker, of a mother who does, does this, he too will be transformed. And if the poet succeeds in achieving this simple consciousness, he too will be transformed into an element in an immense activity. Neruda obviously was a people's poet. He, was, he lived among the people. He, he read his poems among a crowd full of stadium. A, a stadium full of crowd, and but uh, 
And when he read in his home country, Chile, there were thousands of people present as people are present in football matches here. But that was, that was an exception. Poets, we have to find our solitude. We have to confront the blank sheet of paper. At, e at the end of the day, we have to confront the blank sheet of paper. Abandoning all our, all the definitions of poetry which I told you. Abandoning all the prizes and, uh, and crowns uh, which a poet has gathered during his uh, poetic career. And the poet has to confront the blank sheet of paper. And that's what in poetry really comes in the end. Thank you.